any y'all want, we can start with the lesson part of this. All right, go ahead. Andy DeLay, president of Tampa Bay Paranormal Investigations, and we are at the Dade Battlefield in Bushnell, Florida, for our investigation of the Dade Battlefield. All right. I'll go ahead and, and start with what we're doing here tonight. So everybody knows and what's going on here. And this, wow. Well, Hello. The hell is that? Someone's saying hello already. A squirrel throwing crap on us. Anyway, in 1835, in December of 1835, there was a big battle here, as you know. And a lot of folks say that it was a massacre. Let's go back a little bit farther before what happened here. What was here was called the Military Road. And it went between Fort Brook, which was Tampa, and Tampa is now the Fort Brook parking garage, if you've all heard of that. But that's where it once stood. It was a military outpost. This road went between there and Fort King, which is in Ocala now. And uh, what had happened, um, going all the way back, let's talk about the history of the Seminoles, and which is actually pronounced as Seminoles. All right, the Seminole are not a aboriginary Indian group from Florida. They are not from here. Those Indians, the Timicoyans and the Calusa and all of the original Indians of the area were either taken into slavery or killed by natural causes, by the, the uh, you know, illnesses brought over from the Spanish or by slavery by at the latest 1690s. They were gone. There was nothing here. Florida was nothing. In the early 1700s, um, the colonies were encroaching. The people were starting to encroach, and especially by the 1720s, into Alabama from Georgia. That was the wild, wild west back then. Well, in Alabama, of course, you had some Cherokees, but you had the Creek clan, the Creek Indians. And you had the Creeks, and were also known as the Red Stick Creeks. They were in southern Alabama, the Red Stick Creeks were. Well, they were encroached on, encroached on, and finally they said, you know, basically, the hell with it, we're going to Spain. And they came into northern Florida, which is now northern Florida, or Spanish Florida at that time, up around Tallahassee, Pensacola, and all of that area, is where they lived. And they had no problems back then. This was Spain. Spain didn't care if they were here. And, uh, and so things were great. However, slave owners in southern Georgia and southern Alabama were complaining that the Indians in Spain were raiding their plantations and stealing their slaves. Which in all actuality what was happening was slaves would run away, come into Spain to get away out of slavery, and they would be taken in by the Creeks and integrated into their society after a period of indentured servitude, usually anywhere from two to five years, then they would just be part of the clan. So, in the 18, uh, 18, 18, 18, 19, there was a, a real horrible person, uh, president of the United States, eventually by the name of Andrew Jackson. Andrew Jackson was rich, wanted, desired fame, fortune, and he wanted the spotlight to be on him for everything. He knew one way that he could garner the vote, especially in the southern states, was to get rid of the Indian problem in Spain, in Florida. So in the early, I mean, in 1820, in that area there, he got a bunch of folks together, a bunch of his people, came in and landed near Pensacola and massacred the Creeks. That was known as the First Seminole Indian War, which was not a war, it was a massacre. So, go forward in time some. At that time, there was, just remember this, there was a half-breed boy that was living with the Creeks at that time. His mother was a Creek, and his father was a white that was integrated into the Creeks. Um, just remember that as we go forward. Finally, Spain said, listen, man, we don't, we don't care for Florida. There's nothing there. They have a settlement called St. Augustine. They have one in Key West. It's better to just... Instead of fighting the United States over it, they sold it for uh, several million dollars to, Florida, to the United States. And then Florida became a territory. Well, great. 
There's nothing down here in Florida except mosquitoes and swamps. No one wanted to live there. They got these Indians down there. So the, the, back in the day, back in the 1820s, 18, uh, before 1830, the United States said, well, what we'll do is if these Creek Indians, which were now being known as the Seminoles, which in uh, Muscogee means wild people, it's, a, it's, it's part of the dialect of Creek, these Seminoles, which were not one group of Indians. There are several groups of Indians. They were known as the Coyote Clan, as the Owl Clan, as the Wolf Clan. All of these clans together were called the Seminoles, as we now call them. Well, the United States says, well, we got all these Seminoles down there. We don't need to make it a problem. Let's just keep them down in, in the central area of Florida. They didn't want them to do, to do business, so to speak, or trade with people from Cuba. So they said anywhere 10 miles in from the coast on either side, south of a certain point, north of a certain point, is where that these people are going to be able to live their life. And that was created at the, at the Treaty of Moultrie Creek, which is south of St. Augustine. This was established. Well, the United States government says we need to build a series of forts, a series of area you know, of outposts from the military around this to make sure that they're not doing business with the Cubans and business with other folks for arms and gunpowder. We want to be the folks that give them food, gunpowder, so we can... So they started building forts. You have Fort Brook, you have Fort, Fort Dade, Fort Lauderdale, Fort Pierce, Fort Myers. Wow, some of these things are starting to sound familiar, aren't they? All of these forts that you keep here of that are now cities in Florida were forts established as boundaries for the second small for the Seminoles. As you continue forward, the Indian Removal Act, which passed Congress, I do believe, by one or two votes anyway, in 1830s, said that all of the Indians in the eastern United States, east of the Mississippi, will now be relocated to the Indian Territory, which is now Oklahoma, which included the ones that were already on their reservation in Florida. Now these, now these Indians said, they were, the Seminoles said, hey, you know, we're supposed to be able to have this reservation for 50 years before we had to renegotiate this. What's going on? In Fort um, King, there was an Indian agent that go between. His name was Wiley Thompson. And Wiley Thompson was charged with telling the Seminoles, trying to corral them up, keep things peaceable, saying, listen, by a certain time in 1836, we want you at Fort Brook, which is Tampa now, and we're going to ship you to the Indian Territory. And what we're going to do is, is they took some of the chieftains, or the uh, halos, or what they were called, and put them on a ship and took them over there and said, this is where we're going to relocate you. And they were over there in Oklahoma and said, there are mortal enemies right next to us. We don't want to be here. So the U.S. government threatened them with death and torture to sign the paper saying that, yes, this is a nice place. We're going to relocate here. Of course, when they came back, they had a big gathering of all the Seminole clans up near Fort King. And the, all the chiefs said, listen, there's a lot more of these soldiers than there are of us. Let's just relocate. It's not worth fighting. We're all going to be killed if we if we don't do this. So um, all the halos they agreed and they weren't going back to their their certain area. Enter this kid, this half breed that watched the slaughter happening in the first Seminole Indian War that I told you about. He's half white. He's half Seminole. He wasn't going to have this. He was not a chief. He was not even a big time warrior in this. But he wasn't going to have this. Him and a bunch of his friends said, no, we're going to fight. We're not going to relocate. As these chiefs went back to their areas, they stopped Hilo Amantla, or they call him Charlie Amantla back in that day, big chieftain of a, a group of the clan of the Seminoles uh, to the west of here. Stopped him on the trail with him and his family. The one of the bandits killed Halo Amantla and chopped his head off, put it 
on the horse with his daughter and said, bring this back to your people and tell them, if you go with the white men, this is how you'll end up. So, this person is now known as Osceola that did this. Of course, word got out that, well, if we go west, Osceola is going to kill us. If uh, we decide to stay here, the white man is going to kill us. Well, let's just stay here. Still, the Seminole Indians were a bit divided. Some of them did go down to Fort Brook, a few hundred of them, and were taken under the protection of the soldiers down there. As time progresses, um, Wiley Thompson brings Osceola to Fort Brook and says, listen, man, that what you're doing isn't the right thing. I don't, we don't need a war. Let's just take everyone west. Well, Osceola said, no, there's no way I'm going, so to speak. And he punches Wiley Thompson. Well, he was arrested and placed in chains, which is a huge, horrible thing to do to a Seminole Indian, apparently. And so after a few days, Osceola finally said, yeah, I'll go tell my people to go east. You're right, and had no intentions of doing it, and was unchained. Go forward in time a few years, and by 1835, the Seminole said, you will not be able to pass up and down this military road between Fort King and Fort Brook. We're not allowing it. And of course, the U.S. government said, that's unacceptable. We are going to traverse the road and keep it open between the two posts. So, in, 18, in December of 1835, a, uh, a commander, a major by the major uh, by the name of Major Dade, and you've heard of Dade City, Florida, Dade County, Florida. Well, it's all named after the guy that was killed at that marker up there. Major Dade was given 118 men. Excuse me, one cannon, and told. You need to fortify Fort King because we think that the Seminoles are about to raid the place. No problem. 118 men and cannon, that's no big deal. So they left Fort Brook for Fort, for Fort King. The first day, as they marched, I should say, they would march in a column or, you know, they weren't marching in step, but they were all just walking, let's put it that way. And he would have flankers out, probably a good another couple hundred yards than this off of the trail going up the sides of the columns to make sure they weren't going to be ambushed. That's common military strategy back in the day. Well, the first day things were fine. They made it as far as Fort Foster. You all may have heard that as in, uh, as in uh, Hillsborough River State Park. It's still a fort. And they made it as far as that and they camped. The flankers said, listen, there are people shadowing us. The Seminoles are shadowing us. No problem. At night as they camped, the second night as they moved forward, uh, which was, I do believe, Christmas, they were heckled and they, were, they had things thrown in the camp. Uh, um, they, all kinds of things were happening at night to these soldiers. Well, what was happening was Osceola and the Seminoles were not going to let this happen. The Seminoles were actually... Four, we're actually shadowing this column right here of men with over 200 of them. And they were waiting for Osceola to meet up with them so that they could ambush this column. They wanted to do it at the Hillsborough River, but it didn't happen. The second day, they crossed the Whitlacoochee River. And still, Micanopi was leading this bunch of folks, and Halapadar Tuscanucci was another leader, and that was also known as Alligator. He was with this group and said, listen, we got to do something. Osceola isn't here yet. And Micanopi says, no, we're not going to do this until Osceola gets here. Well, what Osceola was doing is he was up there at Fort King. The day that this was going to happen, he was going to ambush Fort King and kill Wiley Thompson. Meet up with this and then ambush this. Well, things didn't work out so right, but what happened was by the time we got to right here, we had one more day's march to, to Fort King. Halapadar Tascanushi said, listen, you will, to Mikanopi, you will, if you will raid this, um, this group of folks because 
it's getting open. It's not swampy like it was down near the near the Hillsboro River. It's opening up here. They're only a day away. We're going to lose the surprise. So, at a, uh, the morning that this happened, on say 28 December 1835, the Seminoles left their camp, which would have been about at I-75 now, and came to this spot right where we're standing lining north and south here for about a quarter of a mile. As this, on this trail, as the Ford group, which was led by Major Day, he was on his horse, rode past here, legend says that, and it's not 100% sure, that Micanopy still had doubts about doing this without, uh, without um, Osceola being here. The, see the frog agrees. So anyway, the legend says that Alligator put his, uh, his musket to the head of Micanopi and said, either you fire the first shot or I'll fire the first shot. And the first shot supposedly was fired by Micanopi that downed Major Dade off of his horse, which signaled to the rest of everyone who was laying here and there was... Um, palmetto scrub all through here that was laying here, they rose up and fired. The first volley killed a hundred, killed a hundred of the, all of, all, it killed all of the first, um, the lead element here, and a hundred of the soldiers following just behind them. Boom! That quick. Bow, 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 bow. Well, um, let's see, Captain Frazier what his, what his name was, one surviving officer, who rallied all of the men. They brought the cannon up and they fired the cannon into the, the Seminoles, and the Seminoles all but. They just looked and saw all the men dead. Basically, there was honestly about 30 survivors. And they said, okay, they're all dead and we're going to leave. So what happened was, as Captain Fraser got back to that building back there, and we'll go back and show you this, where they started cutting trees down to make a small enclosure, a little fort. And they brought the cannon up next to it, and they said, we'll make a fort right here and stand our ground. Well, the Seminoles were gone. However, the rear party of the Seminoles stopped and looked back from about where we are and said, wait a second, they're not leaving. So they go up and tell Micanopi. And Micanopi is quoted as saying, well, the God must be telling us it's not done because they are building a pen to be slaughtered in. So instead of thinking run, it had been done, they turned around and came back and killed everyone but three men in that. After all day, they finally ran out of ammunition and were slaughtered. And then they left and they said then the, uh, a band of Negroes came in and, and just totally defiled everybody and, and, uh, and, and robbed them. And then they laid there for two months. Their bodies were, when they were found by uh, Major Gaines, or excuse me, General Gaines, who was looking for this party, was found, there were still buzzards going around, but all their bones had been spread out by the buzzards and the, and the coyotes and the wolves. It was just a mess here. So that's what happened here. That's what we're going to be investigating. Now, really quick, we're talking about Osceola. It's really neat. It's going to be, and I'm not going to take a lot of your time here, but how did Osceola get his name? It's really cool. Does anyone have a clue how Osceola got his name? Well, Osceola, um, whenever, whenever a Seminole reaches about 13 years old, every year they have a celebration of the, of the harvest called the Green Corn Dance. And they still have it here, matter of fact. And during the green corn dance, all of the men or all of the boys that are of that age, about 13 to 14 years old, in order to become men, they have to partake in the black drink. And the black drink, a lot of Indian or a lot of Native Americans did this. The black drink is a real horrible, thick, nasty drink that is, has like a, a million cups of coffee worth of caffeine in one cup and hallucinogens and all this other stuff. Well, the big thing about the black drink is people would drink it, they would sit around, they'd have their hallucinations, and they would projectile vomit this stuff, okay, and that would be done. Well, what happened when it came to this boy, who I'm not sure what his name was at the time, he drank the black drink and got up and started to sing. 
and started to dance. And he did it for hours and didn't puke or projectile vomit. So he got his, his, his true name. His true name was Asiaholai. That means the black street singer in Muskogee. And so now that is his name. The white man, of course, showed, called him Osceola when it was actually Osceolae. So that's that in a nutshell. That's what we're here to investigate tonight, a bunch of stuff. There are reports of full-bodied apparitions here. There are reports back here in the uh, museum, which we'll walk back to right after this, of shadow people. So we got a lot of neat things share. Can we just follow up that the bodies are not actually here? They are not they here dug up and moved. Whenever major gangs arrived, <clears throat> they dug two graves, one for officers, one for the enlistment, if they could figure out who was who. And it's right where the fort was, they buried them right there. I want to say about 20 years later, in the 1850s, they came back and disinterred everyone and moved them to St. Augustine. So they're, now, not to say that there's not, I'm sure. <laughs> there's not something still here, Native American bones, um, God knows what else. That cannon's supposed to be thrown in that lake back there, by the way. The uh, Seminole spiked the cannon and threw it in that lake, and no one's ever said they recovered it. So. They said the Indians only lost like five people, right? Yeah, five people killed for the, for the Seminoles. One of the people say, why you're blasting a cannon out About to kill a frog. <laughs> the cannon was, when it was fired, it would shoot over their head. It would just scare the hell out of them, but that's about it. So, if you don't want to, let's go take a look at where the death pen was. Yeah, I saw everything on Facebook. I haven't put these up there yet. Oh, okay. 